Okay, uh, we're going to uh, be continuing on here. Uh, so last time we started talking about obviously uh, weak acids and how to approach uh, solving weak acid problems and calculating the pH. Weak acid problems are really no different than regular equilibrium problems. Um, the only difference is we use like a different letter there, which is a Ka. <laughs> we still need to do an ice table because it's a weak electrolyte. It's basically staying together. Um, the difference as well is uh, we are usually interested in the pH. So at the end of the ice table, instead of necessarily finding the concentration of everybody, which you could be asked to do that, uh, we're really interested in obviously in the H plus concentration so that we can then go kind of stick that into our pH equation and solve for it. Uh, we could solve these problems exactly the same way as we solve any of the other equilibrium problems that we've done before. So, you know, you could have like a perfect square, you could uh, make an assumption if the K value is small enough. You could also obviously use the quadratic formula to do so. As we saw, I think in a, an example or two here, you do wanna make sure that you do check those assumptions. Again, not always going to be good. And again, for our class, we are using that 5% rule as sort of our deciding there. Remember that you can only really try the assumption uh, when you do have a small value for the equilibrium constant. You can never do the, really the assumption when you have a large value uh, for the equilibrium constant. Again, because that means, you know, you would have a lot of products at equilibrium, which really means the change part of it would be a lot of change that would occur. The reason we could do it again for the small value is that means that we mainly have reactants at equilibrium. And that means there's not a lot of change happening or a lot of guys going over to the product side. So we can kind of make that assumption that, you know, the change is going to occur. It's going to be sort of negligible, not all that much. Any question on those ones we did before there? Okay, so I think we got one more to go here. So why don't we do this? Let's calculate the H plus concentration and why not? Let's also do the pH as well uh, for a 0 0.01 molar hydrocyanic acid, Ka value 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. So take a few minutes and see what you come up with and see how we're doing. So remember that when you look at these problems, again, there's some information that's helpful if you're maybe not sure where to start or what you're dealing with. Again, obviously the biggest hint to where you should start and stuff like that is we do again see a Ka value as we talked about before. Uh, Ka values are only for really weak acids. So you definitely know it's a weak acid. You definitely know you should be doing an ice table in this case. Um, and that's really sort of the direction where you wanna kind of take it. So with that being said, we know we will take our HCN, which we now know if we didn't before that it is a weak acid, it should break apart into H plus and CN minus. And that's gonna give us a Ka value of, was a 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10, I believe, 10. <clears throat> We're starting initially uh, with 0 0.01. So we got uh, 0 0.01. Again, nothing given on the other side. So we could safely assume that it is going to be zeros. We could also, again, safely assume obviously it's going in the product direction here. So we're gonna have our minus X, our plus X and our plus X. That means when we carry it down, we got 0 0.01 minus X, X and X. Any questions on the table there? Our Ka expression in this case would be the concentration of H plus times Cn minus divided by the concentration of HCn. And that obviously would equal our Ka value. Like normal, we're gonna take our equilibrium mine here and put it into that expression. That gives us basically S squared up on top, 0 0.01 minus X on the bottom and that would equal 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. In this case, again, we do see our Ka value is a relatively small value. So it doesn't hurt, going to be wrong once, I suppose. Uh, let's assume X is equal to zero here. That's gonna give us an X squared, a 0 0.01 is equal to 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. 
We're obviously going to multiply the 0 0.01 to the other side and also take the square root. So if we do all that good stuff here, so 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10 times 0 0.01, hit equals, do a little square root action on it. We end up with an X value of, we'll call it, yeah, we'll call it 2.5 times 10, getting old, minus six, I think is what it says. We do wanna make sure it's okay, so we're going to check it. So remember that basically the way that we check it is we take the X value we got, and we're basically going to divide it by the number we were going to subtract it from and times it by 100. And if we do that, I think we are good here as I think we're not even 1%. So I think it's like 0.02-ish percent or something like that. So this is a good assumption. Any questions on that so far? Yeah. Point zero one times by so that's how we check it to make sure it's okay yeah and and again in this case I, I think you get like point zero two ish percent or something like that it's really a small percentage so we're good definitely in this case um, what that means is obviously we can use that x value and because we were interested well I guess that's one of the answers we were interested we wanted the h plus concentration uh, so again something in the ballpark of two point five times ten to the minus six molar maybe with some rounding two point six we'll see. Uh, we could then go into the pH there, since we also wanted the pH uh, would be minus the log of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. And that is going to give me minus the log there of the answer. Looks like a 5.60 on the pH, which is also still acidic, so that's good. Any questions on any of those steps there? And again, clearly, if we were over five, like we know, we got to go back and kind of solve it another way, which in our case, again, would be the quadratic formula. Any questions on that one there? Questions on weak acids. So really still equilibrium problem, just the additional step really of sort of putting it into the pH equation at the end, because that's usually what you're interested in. Any questions? Good. Yeah. Yeah, so that again, that's a you know, sometimes people overlook some of these things that are in the problems. But the idea of a Ka is an equilibrium constant, and really the only thing that will set up a reversible reaction will be a weak electrolyte, which essentially is a weak acid. So, all strong acids and even strong bases, as we'll talk about as well, they're all pretty much one way streets, they're all just going to dump it to the product side. There's really no kind of back and forth, which means they can't set up an equilibrium thus they can't really technically have an equilibrium constant. So that's a really big clue of you're dealing with something that's weak when you definitely either in the problem have a Ka value or even a Kb value as we'll talk about or you can find it on the table. That's a big clue, yeah. Other questions? And like I said before, if you can't or you're not given that and it's not really on the table, then it's probably one of those kind of sixes or so strong acids we saw the other day. And you know, if you just remember those, there'd probably be a strong acid. Other questions? <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about uh, percent ionization. Percent ionization. Percent ionization is uh, basically, for the most part, how we go about checking our assumption. So if you think about how we check our assumption, is uh, we take the x value, which is pretty much the H plus concentration. And we divide it by the initial concentration of the acid. And that's pretty much what percent ionization is. Percent ionization, percent dissociation, these are all fancy words. I don't know how fancy they are, but they're fancy words that basically means how much of the acid breaks apart into H plus is basically what we're talking about here. So how much of that H plus comes off of an acid is the percent ionization. And we again calculate it by taking really the H plus concentration at equilibrium divided by the initial concentration of the acid times it by 100%. Uh, for monoprotic acids, we do again our initial concentration on the bottom there, H plus. If we have a strong acid, as we talked about, it's going to be 100% ionized. Again, there is no reversible reaction. They're pretty much just going to dump into the product side, going to produce a lot of H plus really quickly, which is why really they're considered a strong acid because all they got to do pretty much is go for a swim. 
When we have a weak acid, on the other hand, because they really are sort of like a weak electrolyte, you know, they're going to mainly stay together, which means that hydrogen is going to stay together with like this CL and HCl. I'm uh, sorry, the F and HF, or uh, you know, HNO2 is going to stay together with the NO2 minus. Now, it's still going to break apart a little bit and produce some H pluses, which is why it's still considered an acid, but it's obviously going to produce a lot less H plus than the strong acid, which is why it's considered a weak acid. And that's what we see here. We do see the percent ionization um, sort of decreases with initial concentration. This is like my bad pizza example the other day. Yes. So if we have a really big concentration, like a whole pizza, right? If somebody takes that one slice, not a big deal. But if we have a very small initial concentration of that weak acid, even though it's only technically given away a little bit of H plus, that little bit is a lot compared to where it started with. So again, like, you know, there's only a couple of slices left. You took that one piece, that's a big proportion of what you started with versus if you had the whole thing and just took one piece out. And that's what we saw really early on here when we did that one problem. I think it was originally like 0.5 HF, right? And then we were like, what would happen if we dropped it to like, you know, 0 0.05 a molar HF? And we saw that the assumption was good here, but not so good here. And that again is because we're starting in the second case, which a much smaller concentration, which means even that little bit that comes off is going to be a, a pretty big um, sort of factor. And that's why when we kind of do the 5% rule, that's kind of what we're saying. We're saying, you know, if it's like less than 5%, eh, it's not that much of a big difference. Uh, but if it's greater than 5%, you know, there's a really a significant amount coming off. Um, and we do have to sort of take everything into account. So let's take a look at a problem such as this and sort of talk about how we can kind of get to the solution here. So we have a solution that is eight molar formic acid and it's 0.47% ionized. We want to know what is the Ka value here. So first off, we definitely know it is a weak acid because we're looking for a Ka value, obviously. So we definitely know it's weak. So if we just sort of approach it like a normal weak acid and kind of lay up our ice table, that would maybe not be a bad approach. So we will take our formic acid. We will uh, break it apart into a little H plus and what they like to call, I think, formate here. Our Ka expression in this case would be our products like normal over our reactants. And we can even kind of start the ice table to kind of help us along here. So we can do the ice table. We know that we're starting with eight molar of this guy. We're gonna have zero this guy, zero this guy. The change here would be minus X, plus X and plus X and kind of like normal here, carrying this down 8.0 minus X, X and X. Now, normally in this case, we actually do have the Ka value, which would allow us obviously to figure out everybody's equilibrium concentrations. But in this particular case, we do not have it. So just putting it directly into that expression is not going to help us because we cannot actually solve for it. So we have to look at the other piece of information that's sort of given to us. And the other piece of information that's basically given to us is that this acid is 0.4% ionized. So as we just saw on the previous page, the percent ionization is equal to the H plus concentration divided by the initial acid concentration times 100%. So we can actually use the percent ionization that was given to us to solve for H plus, because we know the initial concentration is eight. We know the percent ionization is there. So if we plop our numbers in there, we got 0.47% uh, is equal to the H plus concentration divided by eight molar times 100%. We're basically going to multiply eight to the other side and divide by 100. 
We're basically taking 0 0.0047 times eight is essentially what we're doing here. We're taking eight times 0 0.47 and dividing it by a hundred. And what that gives us is our H plus concentration of, we'll go 3.76 times 10 to the minus two molar. First off, any questions on that part of the calculation up to there? So why is solving for the H plus concentration kind of important in this case? Because if we now go to our ice table, we can put a little box around H plus. And what we see at this point is the H plus concentration at equilibrium equals X, right? And kind of like that experiment we did, this X is the same X that's here, right? And it is also the same X that is there. So now we're actually able to get the equilibrium concentrations of everybody here. So these two guys would be 3.76 times 10 to the minus two. I'll just not write it twice, I'll just kind of put arrows. This guy is gonna be eight minus 3.76 times 10 to the minus two. And that would get us uh, eight minus 3.76 to the minus two. Gets us a 7.96, it looks like. And now by sort of using that percent ionization, I'm kind of working my way backwards. I now have numbers for everybody that I can now put into my equilibrium expression here. So if we do that, the Ka value would be our products, which technically would be 3.76 times 10 to the minus two squared divided by our reactant, which was 7.96. And by doing so, that should give us our Ka value, which looks like it may be a number. We'll go with uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus four in this case. So this problem is very similar to like that experiment we did the other week. Um, we could kind of use this additional piece of information to really kind of fill in the equilibrium line or ice table that will then allow us obviously to get concentrations for everybody and then allow us to stick it into our expression. Yes. I, uh, so we took our X value, which is basically what H plus equals and put it into here. So that's initial was eight molar, right? Minus the 3.76 to the minus two. It's eight minus 3.76 times 10 to minus two, yeah. Yep. And then that one, because we did have an initial concentration, we had to subtract it off, yeah. And we can see it really didn't change, obviously, all that much, right? You know, it started at eight molar, it basically dropped off 0 0.04-ish uh, in terms of concentration. And again, it's a weak acid, so we don't expect a ton of it to drop off, and we could definitely see it in this particular case. Any questions on percent ionization? So really percent ionization, kind of just like the check that we do when we do make the assumption. But again, you can use it obviously in this sort of application as well. Uh, and basically it just means how much H plus comes off uh, in that particular case. If you're talking about a, a weak base, you could actually do it for a base as well. It just means it's kind of the same thing, how much OH minus would sort of come off in that particular example. Any questions on personalization here? Okay. So let's talk about bases. And since we have weak acids, it would also make sense probably that we do have weak bases. And ammonia here, NH3 is an example of that. Ammonia is a weak base. It's going to like pick up that H plus from water. The result of that is it's going to form OH minus, which is why it's a base there because it does form hydroxide. We could write an equilibrium expression for this, much like all the other equilibrium expressions. We're gonna do our products over our reactants. We're gonna take out water there. And surprisingly enough, it is called a KB. I'm assuming that means base in this case. Um, and the same sort of logic that we use for KA works here for KB. As the KB value increases, so does the strength of the weak base. 
And it's for the same reason. It's because obviously, again, if we have a large K value, that means we should have a good amount of products at equilibrium. And if we have a good amount of products in this type of situation, that means we have a good amount of free OH minus that's floating around in the solution and thus makes it a stronger weak base. So kind of like the Ka, same deal here. Uh, it's a strong weak base, but clearly any type of strong base is much stronger than a weak base that we would have uh, that has a Kb value. Same idea as well, if you see a KB value, that is a very big hint that it is obviously a weak base. And just like our acids, we do not have uh, KB values for strong bases for the same reason. Strong bases, again, will 100% break apart. There is no back and forth, so you don't typically see uh, KB values for strong bases. How do we solve these problems? Pretty much identical to what we've been doing. The difference is because in the equation, there is no H plus, you actually will have OH minus. So you have to do maybe one additional step. You typically will solve for the POH, subtract a little 14 there and get yourself to the pH at that point. So because there's really no H plus in the equation, um, you gotta go to the POH to the pH root. You need to know how to write these equations. These are ones for some reason give people a very difficult time writing the weak base sort of equations and reactions. By the way, if you're not sure what you should react your weak base with, if it's not really reacting with anything else and it's just like in solution, your water is a good guy to kind of put in there in these equations. So you can maybe visually and see that H plus going over to your weak base. It's a good idea to kind of put water in these ones. Um, people very much struggle with coming up with this up here, which you do need to be able to do, yes. Because they struggle to come up with that reaction or equation, they end up oftentimes doing like an acid instead. They like, oh, I'll just throw like H plus or H3O plus in there because that seems like a good idea. And you know, you end up getting something completely wrong. So if it is troublesome for you to write some of these equations, take some time and try to figure out the pattern and you know, make sure you know how to correctly do it. Any questions on that there? So we talked about Ka, we're talking about Kb. Sometimes people also try to, there is a situation that we're going to talk about where you have to know sort of which one you should be using. So if I was to use a Ka in a problem for a calculation, what should I see in the equation? So this is again why it's really important to be able to write these equations because if you write the equation correctly and you look on the product side, you should see H plus or H3O plus there. And that is the key that you should be using a Ka value in your calculation when you're dealing with something that's weak. There will be situations where you'll be given perhaps the wrong value and you need to make sure you are using the right one. Just like when you write the equation correctly, again, why it's important, you look on the product side, you see OH minus there. That is a big key. You should be using a KB value in this calculation. So it's really important to not overlook some of these things and just try to figure it out like I'm just going to kind of copy the math every time. You want to make sure that you understand the equations that you're writing. It can give you obviously a lot of information. Here's a table, not from your book, but you have a similar one, obviously, where you can look up KB values. A lot of organic guys are bases. So why don't we try one here? Uh, the compound ethylamine has a KB value of 5.6 times 10 to the minus four. What would be the pH if you started with a 0.15 molar of this solution? So take some minutes here, see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look, see how you're doing. So again, you wanna look at this and you know make sure you don't overlook some stuff in it. Clearly, they give us a KB value, which in case you weren't sure, should tell you that this guy is a weak base. Now, that's also going to be very helpful for you if you're not sure how to write the equation. You could start with the C2H5NH2. And again, when you're dealing with really weak bases, it's a good thing to react water with it. If you weren't sure you know, how to do this, you should at this point understand that a base does what? It accepts a 
H plus. So that is, you know, where you could kind of see that happening. It should be taking the H plus. The result of that is we're going to get a C2H5. I'm just going to throw the H at the end there. And that really is how we're going to produce hydroxide here when the water sort of gives away the H plus. So again, if you struggle with the equation, um, you could use this to sort of help you and just some basic definitions, obviously, of what an acid does, what a base does. The bronsted lowry definition can really help you kind of get the entire equation uh, sort of there. Again, as I mentioned, part of your grade on exams and quizzes is correctly writing these equations, not just laying up math. Yeah, so you got to be able to do these things. At this point, uh, we can do an ice table because, again, the KB value is going to also tell us, obviously, it's weak. We should be doing a nice table. We have the initial concentration of 0.15, 0 and 0. Change is going to be minus x, plus x, and plus x, which means at equilibrium, 0 0.15 minus x, x and x. By the way, I'm not doing anything with water because it is a liquid, right? And will not be included in the equilibrium constant because it's a liquid. So best not to put numbers where you might want to use them or something crazy like that. This could go into our KB expression, which should be, again, our products over our reactants. So that's going to be our C2H5 NH3 plus our OH minus divided by our original weak base there. So putting in our guys here, x squared divided by 0 0.15 minus x will equal the KB value given to us, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Now it is a small value of K, so you can assume x is equal to 0. Is it good? Is not good based on our rules here. You should have ended up with 6.1 percentage which should give you a very unhappy face probably at that point. So again, following the 5% rule, this technically would be too much to do the assumption, which means we really need to come back and focus in on this and solve it, obviously, through the quadratic. Any questions up to that point? All right, so let's do that then. Let us uh, carry this over. We're going to go uh, x squared up on top. 0 0.15 minus x on the bottom, and we got uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4. We're going to multiply what's on the bottom to the other side, going to give us x squared is equal to 8.40 times 10 to the minus 5 minus uh, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4x, bringing everybody back to the same side going to give us an x squared plus a 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4x. And that's going to be a minus 8.40 times 10 to the minus 5 is equal to 0. Any questions on that there? That is then going to go into our favorite thing, the quadratic. So uh, we got x is going to equal our minus b, which would be minus 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4 plus or minus my square root. Again, if you clean up what's in the square root, you should get like 3.36 times 10 to the minus four, which upon square rooting that will get you like 1.83 times 10 to the minus two. That's going to be divided by two times a, which is two. That then should give us obviously two x values here, doing the plus and doing the minus. And if we did the minus, we obviously get a negative number minus 9.43, I think, times 10 to the minus 3. Or if we do the plus, we end up with 8.87 times 10 to the minus 3. Any questions on that there? Yeah. We good? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> At this point, uh, obviously, uh, Going back to our ice table here, since we're really interested in the OH minus concentration, 
clearly because it does equal x, we can't use the negative number. That would not be so good. So we would want to obviously not use that guy. We will want to use this guy right here. And that means that according to our table, that is equal to X, which is equal to the OH minus concentration. And we could throw a molarity on there for good measure. Remember though, in these cases here, we are actually getting the OH minus. So this is not going to be our pH, right? We could solve for our POH here. POH gonna be minus the log of our OH minus, 8.87 times 10 to the minus three, going to yield us a POH of 2.05. Again, if you got confused at this point and thought that was the pH, it should not make sense to you because this is a base, which means we should have a basic pH. The last step here would go our pH is equal to 14 minus our POH. And that's going to yield us an 1195 or there, which definitely is a basic pH and does make sense here. Any questions on any of those steps there? So really very similar to everything else we've done. Again, I just, most of these things are just a couple of extra things you gotta do or change. Here, obviously, we're always gonna end up with the OH minus concentration, which at first will get us obviously to the POH and then to the pH. Any questions on that? We're moving towards this direction of the answer. Yes, I'm not the only one. Yes, okay, I'll make sure. <laughs> Again, another good example to make sure you do check your assumption, obviously, yes. Any questions on weak bases? How to do them? All right. So again, the two very stumbling blocks for most people getting that initial equation. And at the end here, they oftentimes a, because they can't get the equation right a lot of times, and B, they sometimes think the OH minus gives them the pH at that point. So those are two very common, you know, errors that people make. Try not to do that. Yes. All right. So we have our Ka value that comes from obviously a dissociation of a weak acid. We also have a Kb value that comes from a dissociation there of a weak base. And as we talked about before in the previous chapter, we can add up equilibrium reactions like this. And if we do, we will actually end up with our good friend water being left over, which also has a value that is Kw. As I mentioned before, and as we'll talk about very shortly here, there are certain problems where perhaps you're given the Kb value, but you really need to use the Ka value and vice versa. So it would be nice if there was a great way to do that. And there is, you can use Kw, which is the same Kw we used previously, which is the one times 10 to the minus 14. And if you have the Ka value, you need to get to the Kb value. You basically can't convert it. It's basically one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by the Ka or the Kb value to get the other one. And that's a very quick and convenient way to get yourself the one that you need. So we're gonna talk about salts and hydrolysis reactions coming up here in this chapter. And those are very common ones where they kind of give you the wrong K value in the actual problem. You actually need usually the opposite one of what they give you. So you can use this obviously to convert it to what you need. This also goes back to where we were just talking about earlier today. You look at the equation, you write the equation correctly, you see H plus there, you should be using the Ka even though in your heart you want to use the value they gave you in that problem, yes? And if you write that reaction, you got that OH minus, you should be laying up a KB if you want to get it correct, yes? And again, it's very hard for a lot of people because they're like, they gave it to me in the problem. I feel like I should use that, you know, in the calculation. But again, uh, the way you will use it in most cases when you have to do that is like down here, switched into the correct value. So again, don't mean to harp on it, but it does go back to being able to properly write these things. So, you know, if you're able to write these equations and these reactions and you can look at them, they give you a tremendous amount of information as to how to do the math part of it. Again, if you write it correctly and you see H plus, you know, hey, I should be heading in the Ka direction. OH minus, I should be doing like a Kb type calculation.
So let's talk a little bit about uh, the actual acid strength and the structure of acids. So there's two types of acids. The first type of acid here is one where there is basically no oxygen. So these are like your hydrochloric acid, your hydrofluoric acid, your hydrobromic acid. And you know some people think, well, electronegativity is really what I should look at. And everybody remembers what electronegativity is, the ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself, right? And it increases as you go up and to the right on the periodic table, right? Increases electronegativity. Fluorine being the most electronegative. And you may think that that's sort of the overwhelming thing that you should look at, but actually in this type of acid, when you're dealing really with a acid that does not contain oxygen, it's actually the bond enthalpy or the bond strength that really determines, you know, which one's going to be a weak acid or, or a stronger acid. Bond enthalpy, as you might have talked about during bonding, maybe, I think we did, I think, it is basically the energy required to break or make a bond, basically, right, it is how much energy you got to put in or take out. Uh, when you break a bond, you got to put it in, which is endothermic and positive. When you make a bond, you got to release the energy, which is negative and exothermic. So when we look at the bond enthalpy or the bond strength really here, what we see is that the hydrofluoric bond or the hydrogen and fluorine bond has 568 versus the HI bond, which is only about 298 to break it. Because HF has much more energy required to break that bond, it makes HF a much weaker acid because the definition of an acid is the ability to produce H+. So if it takes a lot of energy to break this bond, which is how you produce H+, that means the H is gonna hang on there longer. And that means it's going to be a weaker acid. You're gonna get less H+, produced. Down here with HI, it doesn't take as much energy to break that bond, which means it's going to pop off a lot easier. The result of that is you're going to produce a lot more H plus in solution. And the result of that is it's actually a stronger acid. So most of our guys that do not have oxygen uh, is group seven pretty much. So actually acid strength increases as you go down group seven. HI is actually the strongest. HF is the weakest of those. So these three here are really considered strong acids. That is a weak acid. And you have a fairly good jump in terms of the bond energy between those two. And again, that's basically going to mean that the HF is going to hang on to that H a lot longer and not release as much, making it a much weaker acid. So if you're trying to compare acid strengths of acids that do not have oxygen, you actually should be looking at the bond energy or bond enthalpy, stronger bond energy, weaker acid, obviously lower bond energy, much stronger acid. Any questions on that there? Yeah. We're gonna actually talk about ones with oxygen right now. So let's talk about those. When we're dealing with acids that, so in this case, by the way, again, uh, HF would obviously be much weaker than HI. Um, when we dealing with, Here's another little figure there that kind of shows the same thing. When we're dealing with oxy acids, which they are sometimes called, they're called oxy acids because they do contain oxygen, basically. And because they contain oxygen, uh, we do look at one of two things, depending on the situation and what we're comparing. We may look at electronegativity, as we just talked about, which again increases up and to the right on the periodic table. We also may look at the oxidation state. So took 200 A, you did some redox stuff, right? Oxidation state, oxidation numbers. And in certain cases, we wanna actually look at the oxidation state. And in other cases, we actually wanna look at electronegativity. So let's talk about you know when we should look at which one. So let's just say we're comparing both of these acids here. Basically, the only difference here is our central atom. We got chlorine on one, and we got bromine on the other there. Now, in this particular case, they're in the same group and they also have the same oxidation number. So if you're not sure how to assign oxidation numbers, a very quick review is if you have oxygen, that's a really good place to start. For the most part, unless it's peroxide, oxygen has an oxidation state of minus two. So all these would be minus two, minus two, and minus two. 
The hydrogen has an oxidation state of plus one. When you add up all your oxidation numbers, they should equal zero or whatever the overall charge is on the actual guy. In this case, that's minus two, minus two, minus two is minus six. Plus one is minus five. So to balance it out to zero, because there is no charge on this, it would be plus five for bromine. Same thing over here. If we look at the chlorine, minus two, minus two, minus two, and plus one for the hydrogen. Again, giving us minus six for all the oxygens, plus one for the hydrogen, gives us a minus five. Again, this acid does not have an overall charge, so we need to balance it out. And again, we end up with the same oxidation state here of plus five on the chlorine. As you may remember, are not, let me tell you, yes, the oxidation state or number is not necessarily what you associate the typical ionic charge with a with an element. It's kind of the charge they take on when they are in a covalent bonding situation like we are here, where they're sharing electrons, they kind of take on that charge. So in this particular case, because they basically both have the exact same oxidation number, that's really useless in helping us determine which one is sort of the stronger acid. So because of that, what we do want to look at actually is the electronegativity here. So when we compare chlorine to bromine, they are in the same group. Chlorine is higher up in the group, which means it is more electronegative. Why is that important? Well, we're looking at really this bond here. I'll just draw that part of it versus this bond here. Very badly drawn there. So <clears throat> because chlorine is more electronegative, what does that mean in terms of the electrons? They are heading in which direction? They're heading towards the chlorine, right? Before we do any of that, is the OH bond polar or nonpolar? Polar would be the right answer there. Yes, an OH bond is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. That means to begin with, there is a partially positive charge there, right? A partially negative charge there because the electrons in OH are heading in this direction. Now you got this guy, which is more electronegative than say the bromine, same thing's happening here, which means those electrons are now gonna be attracted even more to the chlorine in this case. Why is that important for an acid? We're looking at this bond right here, yes? So if all the electrons are heading towards the chlorine, this bond becomes weaker and weaker, right? Which means it could pop off a lot easier. We don't get as much of a movement of the electrons here because bromine is less electronegative, which means the H is gonna hang on in this bond a lot more and making it a weaker acid. So because of the electronegativity of the chlorine, it's gonna really kind of make that polar bond even more polar, if you will, kind of really making that unequal sharing of electrons even more. That's going to weaken the OH bond, allow the hydrogen to come off a lot easier and making it a stronger acid. So in the comparison of these two, the HClO, Three here is a much stronger acid or a stronger acid, I don't say much stronger, this is a stronger acid than HBrO3, again, because of the strong electronegativity of chlorine versus bromine here. And ultimately what's happening is in an oxy acid, they pretty much all have this bond. And it's really, that's where the hydrogen comes off of. So because of the increase in electronegativity on chlorine, it makes it much weaker, easier for that H plus to come off and becomes a stronger acid. Question on that. Now, this is a case where you're comparing two acids where, again, basically they're kind of in the same group, if you will, but they definitely have the same, basically, oxidation numbers. So you can't use that to help you decide. Now, there can be a, a situation where we look at two acids where they actually have the same kind of central atom. And all these acids here, hyperchlorous, chlorous acid, chloric acid, and perchloric acid, the center guy or the center atom for the most part is all chlorine, which means clearly the chlorine in each case has the same electronegativity value, right? So you cannot use electronegativity here because they're all the same element. So in this case, you do need to look at oxidation number of that central atom. 
because electronegativity, again, not going to help you here. Again, oxygen here minus two, hydrogen plus one. That gives you a minus one overall, which means in this situation here, the chlorine has a plus one oxidation state. Chlorous acid, minus two, minus two in terms of the oxidation states of the oxygen, plus one for hydrogen. That is minus four and plus one is minus three, which means in this situation, the chlorine is taking on a plus three sort of role. Here's the one I think we did on the previous page, minus two, minus two, minus two, plus one. The chlorine here, like it says, taking on a plus five oxidation state. And lastly here, perchloric acid, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, and plus one. That's like a plus seven, minus seven, which means the chlorine here takes on a plus seven sort of persona. The same idea is if we look at that bond where that hydrogen is gonna come off of, again, it's polar to begin with, electrons coming towards the oxygen. When we have our plus seven chlorine here in the middle, that's gonna yank those electrons even closer in, again, weakening this bond, allowing it to come off a lot easier than when we have only that plus one kind of pull. If you remember, when we were talking about attraction of things that are oppositely charged, the attraction gets stronger when the charge gets larger, right? So kind of a larger charge, bigger attraction, like a bigger magnet, if you will. So when we look at hyperchlorous acid, it is pulling those electrons in even more, but it's not pulling it anywhere near the extent that this guy is with his plus seven oxidation state. And that means that in terms of acid strength, this guy here would be number one. This guy would be number two, that would be number three, and that would be the weakest out of all of those because it has a smaller oxidation number. So in a situation where you're comparing acids that have the exact same sort of element, again, electronegativity is not going to help you in that situation, especially when there's oxygen involved. You need to look at the oxidation number of the center atom. When you are looking at two elements in an oxy acid that have the same oxidation number, then you need to look at electronegativity. And if you're comparing guys that do not have oxygen, you should be looking at bond strength. Any questions on how to compare? Any questions? Good. Yeah. All right, then let us talk about salts. So first off, right, we get salts from the reaction really of an acid plus a base, right? Produces two things, produces a salt and water, right? A salt as you probably are familiar with is a ionic compound, yeah? which basically means we got a positive guy and a negative guy here together. And it's really important to, especially in the cases of salts as we'll talk about here, it is really important to understand like where they come from, yeah? So when we produce a salt, it's really important for us to understand sort of where they came from because it will help us with the math. So for example, if I had a salt like sodium chloride, for example, if I had to make an educated guess here, what acid and base did that probably come from? Hydrochloric acid, that would be the acid most likely. And the base would probably be sodium hydroxide, yeah? Double displacement reaction happening here, right? H plus and OH minus make water, right? Sodium and chloride come together, right, to make the salt. So when we think about salts, sometimes it's really helpful to think about where it came from because it will really help us sort of answer the question of, you know, what's this going to do to the pH? In this case, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide are strong or weak acids and bases. What are these? These are, they're both strong, right? Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. 
The other really important thing when we think about salt is something that we talked about early on in this chapter, which is if I have a strong acid, is conjugate base, is it weak or strong? It is actually opposite. So if it's a strong acid, the conjugate base would be weak. If it's a strong base, his conjugate partner will also be weak. And remember that we also saw that if it's a weak, I'll write both, <laughs> acid or base, his partner, his conjugate partner, if you will, will be strong. So this opposite relationship is really important in salts because frankly, this is the conjugate partner to this acid, really, right? And understanding where it comes from will, under, will help you understand, will that salt do anything? So that opposite relationship you wanna definitely keep in mind as we kind of go through the salts here. So let's start with actually this type of salt here. There are certain salts which are what we refer to as being really neutral salts. Neutral salts means that if we have a solution of that salt, neutral means the pH should be seven, yeah? So we have a salt that is going to basically be neutral. And as we just saw, this sodium chloride basically comes from two things that are strong. It essentially comes from sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid which means each of those things technically are going to be weak. And when we're talking about weak and we're talking about strong and weak in relationship to salt, what we are talking about is will that salt continue to react with the other guy that is present, which is water. Now, in certain cases, the salt will decide, I would like to continue on reacting with water. And in certain cases, the salt will decide, I'm good, I'm done. And this is a situation where the salt will decide I'm done. I'm not going to go react with water because I'm relatively weak and that will yield us a neutral solution. So although they don't especially say it a lot of times, anytime you have a salt that contains anything from group one or two on the periodic table, it, that guy is pretty much going to be a neutral salt. It's not gonna go and react with water, which is known as going through hydrolysis. It's pretty much just gonna be neutral. That is really because as we talked about group one and two on the periodic tables where we typically find our strong bases really come from, right? So you can think about it as coming from a strong base or just as group one or two on the periodic table, those guys will be neutral. The Cl minus in this case, again, thinking about it backwards, comes from HCl, which is strong, meaning this guy is weak meaning there will be no reaction with water. And again, we would expect this to yield us basically a neutral pH. So if we have a solution of, of sodium chloride, we would expect it to have a pH of about seven because there's really no further reaction going on with water. Any questions on that there? All right, so let's talk about though, if we had this salt here, Let's say we have this salt, which is sodium acetate. First off, if it is a salt and an ionic compound, most salts and ionic compounds, do they stay together or do they break apart when it goes for a swim in water? They do break apart. Most salts, right, are, are ionic compounds are strong electrolytes, right? So something like sodium acetate, which is a salt, when it is in solution, will break apart into a sodium ion and an acetate ion. Or if you like C2H3O2, you can write it that way too. It's all good. Now, this is basically what we got floating around in solution. So let us think about first off, where this salt perhaps came from. So what if we had to make an educated guess, and since most salts do come from a reaction of an acid and a base, what acid would sodium acetate come from? 
it would be acetic acid, right? That's basically the acid you get when you put an H plus on acetate. So we get a reaction of really acetic acid and the sodium probably as well came from sodium hydroxide like we saw in the previous one. And again, if you did your kind of double displacement reaction, right? Acetate, which is negatively charged, will end up with the sodium. And that is how we produce sodium acetate. And our OH minus from our base and our H plus from our acid is where we get our water from. So what I just wrote here is really most likely the origin of our sodium acetate sitting in our beaker is where it came from. You may ask yourself, why is that important? It's important for what we just talked about. First off, we know that the sodium came from this guy, right? When we think about the salt, sodium hydroxide, stronger weak base, strong, which means technically speaking, our sodium should be weak, which means it's really a neutral part of it, which means I'm not going to be concerned in this case about it, right? It's basically not going to do anything with water. It's not going to continue to react with water. Now, the acetate from our sodium acetate most likely came from this acid. This acid is stronger weak acetic acid. It is actually a weak acid. It's like vinegar, yes, and all that good stuff. It's actually a weak acid, which means that the acetate here, will it be strong or weak? It will be strong. It's that opposite relationship, right? So this is really important to understand that when we have a solution of sodium acetate, the sodium really because it's group one or two and really because it comes from a strong base is not going to do anything. But when we do produce that acetate, it is going to be relatively strong because it came from that weak acid. So as I mentioned before, when we're talking about it being relatively strong, it's going to decide I would like to continue to react. And if you think about the original equation where it probably came from, the other thing in the beaker is water. And it's going to continue to react with water in this case. So we're going to get an actual, what is referred to as sometimes as a hydrolysis reaction, where the acetate. will react with water. And again, this is important for doing the math part of it is to do this equation right. So you're now gonna tell me what's going to happen with this. Is it going to accept an H plus or donate an H plus? That does both answers. So again, let us see how we get to sort of the correct answer. We want to think about where it came from, right? So it did come from this acetic acid, which means its conjugate partner would be a conjugate base. Definition of a base is somebody that will accept an H plus. So when the acetate reacts with water, it's going to act as like the conjugate base or really a base. And it is actually going to pluck off an H plus here from water because it's going to act as a base. The result of that is we're going to make acetic acid and we're going to produce hydroxide in this case. First things that could help you along with this is it will always make where it came from. Yes, so the acetate came from acetic acid in this type of reaction with water, it will always make where it comes from. More importantly, you're also gonna tell me this solution should be acidic, basic, or neutral. I heard basic and I agree with you. It is basic because we have just produced hydroxide in this reaction, yeah? So when we have a salt solution of sodium acetate, because the acetate part is relatively strong, it will go through this hydrolysis reaction here which is a fancy way of saying we're reacting with water. The salt will then pick up the H plus from the water and act as a base producing hydroxide. And just by writing this equation correctly here, you can make a pretty good guess and a correct guess that if you calculated the pH, you should have a basic pH. By the way, when I do this calculation, 
this is like a weak situation here. Should I be using a Ka or a Kb? I should be using a Kb. Also, why the equation is important. I see hydroxide. I should be using a Kb. I say that because in this problem, they will give you the Ka value for acetic acid for sure. So these are definitely the problems, salt problems, where they give you sort of the wrong K value, if you will. You got to be able to, again, write these equations, look at them, and decide which one you should use. And that's not a problem for us because this would be a situation where we would take the KB is equal to KW divided by KA that we saw on the previous slide at one time 10 to the minus 14. We could convert it. And then as you probably could also imagine, if I wanted to calculate the pH here, what type of calculation should I be doing underneath that equation? I should be doing an ice table, yes, because it's a weak situation here. So I would be doing an ice table. I would be solving for X. X in this case would equal the hydroxide concentration, which would allow me to calculate the pOH. And then I got to subtract 14 to get me to the pH. So again, everything helpfulness comes out with the equation. Very helpful to help you do the math part correctly. Any questions on that? So if you have a salt or a part of a salt that basically came from a weak acid, that salt part will go through hydrolysis. It will continue to react with water. It will always react as a base. It will always produce hydroxide which means you will always have a basic solution at this point. Any questions on that? So that is, I believe, what it says down here. Hopefully. Now, in addition to uh, basic salts, there obviously can be acidic salts. And kind of works the same way. If we have something like let's go here, this salt, which I think is on your next slide there. Ammonium chloride. When this breaks apart, because it's a salt, you will get ammonium, which is NH4 plus, and you will get chloride. If you had a venture guess here, the acid that this came from would be? HCl, yes. How about the base? What kind of looks like that? And you probably called it that when you're doing naming. NH3, ammonia, yes, we used it. We use it tonight, I think, as well. So between the reaction of HCl and NH3, we would get basically the H plus coming over here, which would produce NH4 plus and really Cl minus, you can put them together, you can leave them apart if you want. Now, this is going to help us decide when we look at ammonium chloride, first off, the chloride here came from HCl, will it go through hydrolysis, will it react with water? Cl minus came from HCl, which is a strong acid, which means Cl minus is going to be so it's an opposite relationship. So a strong acid means Cl minus would be a weak conjugate base, which means is a neutral salt, will not go through hydrolysis like we saw with sodium chloride, right? Same deal. NH4 plus comes from NH3. NH3 is ammonia, right? Ammonia is a weak base. That means NH4 plus is weak or strong. It is strong, which means in this case, even though it's not written here, there is water in an aqueous solution. That means that this NH4 plus will continue on and react with water. Again, we can use the same logic. The NH4 plus came from a weak base, which means the NH4 plus should act as a base or an acid. Should act as an acid, right? Base conjugate acid pair, right? acid conjugate base pair. So this would be an acid, which means the acid is going to donate the H plus. When it donates the H plus, we get one more time where it came from. We get NH3 made and we produce H3O plus. 
So again, without doing an actual calculation, picking up our calculator, we should know this solution should be, should be acidic, right? Because we just produce a bunch of H plus, H3O plus. We also know that when we do our ice table on this, we should use what type of K value? We use a Ka also because we produce H3O plus. So if you have a salt or a part of a salt that came from a weak base, that part of the salt will go through hydrolysis. It will act as an acid, meaning it will always donate an H plus to the water. You will always produce H3O plus and end up with an acidic solution and thus also an acidic pH when you actually calculate. Any questions on that there? All right, well, that sounds like fun. We will stop there today.